I'm Lisa Fox. I'm a professor at the University of South Florida and a faculty member with the ACTA Center. I'm excited about having this opportunity to talk with you about scaling up evidence-based practices. I'm going to share with you four critical elements that are important to your initiative. And then Lisa Backer and Michelle Doctor from the Minnesota Department of Ed will talk with you about how these four elements have been implemented in their state system. As a state begins the process to implement an initiative, it is critical to ensure that it is informed by implementation science and that organization leaders understand the stages, steps, and activities that are involved. ECTA has provided this online guide that we encourage you to review before starting your initiative. We have identified four critical elements that are essential to an initiative that will be successful and sustainable. These elements are a state leadership team that plans the effort and ensures an infrastructure, a master cadre of technical assistance professionals who can train and provide external coaching to programs, implementation sites, that can serve as demonstrations of implementation, and the use of data and data decision-making to track implementation progress and outcomes. A great resource for states is a state planning guide that we have used to help states understand these elements and plan for implementation. This is available on the ECTA website. Our first critical element is related to leadership. To tackle an initiative that is complex and involves system and program change, you must have a team that's charged with the state implementation task. The leadership team will ensure that resources are available, systems are integrated, and that an infrastructure for sustainability is built. The second element is the identification of a master cadre of technical assistance professionals who will be able to provide ongoing training in the evidence-based practices and external coaching to local programs as they guide program-wide implementation of the practices. In this approach, we identify professionals who can provide training and practices data decision-making, including the use of a fidelity tool, coaching for practice implementation, and the leadership processes that programs will use to support implementation. The third element is establishing demonstration sites where the evidence-based practices are being implemented. In these program-wide sites, a local leadership team ensures that practitioners have the support for implementing evidence-based practices. Once established, the demonstration sites can be used in scale-up to inspire other local programs to make the commitment for program-wide implementation. The tasks of the leadership team are listed on these tools that teams use to assess their current status and identify action steps. These tools are available on our website. I encourage you to review the tools to see the tasks of the team and what's needed to establish a local infrastructure of support for program-wide implementation. Our final critical element is the use of a data decision-making approach. This is used at both the state and the program level. The state team has its own benchmarks of quality that is used to guide their implementation steps and track their progress, and the state accesses program data to ensure that the initiative is successful and the use of evidence-based practices has been improved. Now that I've introduced these four critical elements, Lisa Backer and Michelle Doctor will share with you the specifics on how these have been implemented in Minnesota. Hello, my name is Lisa Backer and I am with Minnesota Department of Education. I am here with my colleague Michelle Doctor and we have been asked to share with you um, a bit about Minnesota's experience using active implementation and scaling up evidence-based practices 
and most specifically our experience with the recommended practices that were newly revised by the Division of Early Childhood. I'm going to take you back in time a little bit um, because one of the things that we wanted to share was that through our work we've really learned some important lessons. Building our professional development system has been now almost a decade-long endeavor. So that's lesson number one, that really that building a system takes time. Um, the second piece is that building a system and really implementing high-quality professional development requires a tremendous state and local investment. And please don't gasp, but right now our professional development system is our single largest discretionary investment of our Part C and 619 federal dollars, right now more than $2 million a year. Um, we are investing in our professional development system. The other critical piece, um, lesson number three, is the importance of frameworks of active implementation. When we started our professional development system, we did a survey of our local early childhood special ed program leaders and said, we're really you know, creating a new focus on professional development. What are the needs that you would like this system to address? And the three things that rose to the top were supporting practitioners to address challenging behaviors, helping um, practitioners more effectively meet the needs of children who are linguistically diverse, and supporting um, our Part C infant toddler interventionists to deliver effective home visits. And so those became our three areas of focus as we started our professional development system. We were fortunate enough to be selected to implement um, TAXI as part of the first round of competition. And then we had two other initiatives, one focused on linguistic diversity, one focused on effective home visiting. TAXI was implemented using the frameworks of active implementation at a program-wide level. The other two were not. You can imagine which one took off and grew which two did not. And so that little experiment, a kind of an unintentional experiment, really proved to us the importance of not only selecting evidence-informed practices, but the importance of implementing those practices in a way that would support achieving a level of um, fidelity and scalability. And then our final lesson before I turn it over to Michelle to have her really tell you about our system is that installing an evidence-based practice in a weak program does not create a strong program. And through a self-assessment system, we helped identify which programs were able to demonstrate a level of programmatic strength and quality necessary to take on the additional work of installing an evidence-based practice with fidelity. So those are our, our four critical takeaways of our system. And now Michelle, our professional development leader and manager, and those are two very distinct roles, leading and managing the millions of details of creating this system, will share with you what we're doing with our system, with active implementation, and with the recommended practices. Okay. Uh, yes, we are really working to create a statewide system of professional development, and I feel um, great responsibility. <laughs> For that, those $2 million. <laughs> those $2 million that go into this system. And with that, I would say that um, what we've created is a regional system throughout the state of Minnesota where we've hired professional development facilitators who actually support local leaders within each region. That's been a really critical step for us because we've determined that our um, sphere of influence is really touching local leaders and helping them make changes and improvements and qualitative um incremental changes in their programs that, have, that affect statewide quality. And to have that lever to touch those people, we use the professional development facilitator. Um, that person is there to help a local leader identify their quality and their weakness, and to help that local leader identify ways in which they can work on those things. Because as Lisa said, creating that strong foundation is really important. Once a program feels that they've achieved all those things, then the professional development facilitator really works with them to help identify need. And we have three, what we're calling innovations, that have kind of morphed and evolved out of what Lisa described earlier, that really we feel address those general kinds of areas. So we're using the pyramid model to talk about social emotional learning. 
We're using classroom engagement model to talk about those inclusionary and classroom kinds of practices for young children. And then we're talking about family guided routines based interventions to help those home visiting strategies and teachers and practitioners really have that relationship with people. Last two years, we've had the opportunity to have um, the recommended practices also be in the state of Minnesota. And when we first began working with then Carol Trivet and Lisa Fox in those kind of work with that work with us, what we told them from the beginning is that our scale, um, our scaling of that practice in the state of Minnesota was going to be to include those important early childhood recommended practices within each of the innovations that we have working in the state of Minnesota. And that's really what we worked hard to do with their knowledge and expertise. And so, again, we have those three innovations that we focus most of our um, early childhood special education professional development resources around, and then they are embedded within that. Um, I think the another lesson that we've really learned is that readiness aspect. And so we've been working really hard and when I say we, I mean the professional development facilitators and the local leaders, to really look at the readiness of a program. And we have relied a lot on active implementation to help us do that. So I'm going to refer you back to tools like the Hexagon tool, for example, which is a tool that the, the, the active implementation site created. And it is a tool that really helps a local program think about what are, the, what are the resources and the competing interests and the availability and all sorts of factors that help them decide are we really at a position and ready to take on a new thing, like adding an innovation. We have an application process where we have walk programs through some readiness and some understanding of what the actual implementation of an innovation might look like, what the expected outcomes of that innovation might truly be, for them, and then do they have the capacity to do really some important things around coaching, which is to take that new knowledge that a teacher might have and support them with an internal coach to help them do the work and make the change in their practice, and with we, the state of Minnesota, providing an external coach to help the leadership team keep looking at what are we doing, how can we make this work, what might we have to add to this whole process. The external coaching function, Michelle, where does that come from? The state of Minnesota has hired the professional development facilitators, and they, in their regions, wear two distinct hats. Mm -hmm. The first hat would be with any local program saying, let's just think about what's going on here, help me do some problem solving, let's think of what I'm doing. And then if a program is deemed ready and they actually want to try to install an innovation, that same external coach, that same PDF person acts as an external coach to, the, to that innovation. Okay. So they work to help that local team really take the knowledge and skill and use the frameworks of active implementation and install that with fidelity in the program so that we make sure that they're doing the things that are part of the program and what they want to do. Um, I know, I mean, I mentioned the investment that we're making. Can you describe how we are financially supporting the local programs that have been selected to install our innovation? So the, through this application process, and again, looking at all these various factors, we create a, an application, and if a program is selected, then we've also created a fiscal agreement with them where we have determined a certain amount of money and we give that to a program, and we, and we jointly work on installing that in the program. Um, and we have created a fiscal agreement that will last for five years. That number five was chosen because we know in the science of active implementation that it takes two to four years to make something really work and stick and change and scale and live there. And we found before with our previous use of work that two years wasn't really enough. Mm -hmm. And we kind of came up with a five-year mark. I can't say that we have, can, I can pick a piece of it data. It seemed like a good number. Yeah. <laughs> but we know that it needed to be more than two. And so the fiscal agreements that we have with them is for five years. And what happens is in year one, you would get 100% of the funds. And in year two, you would get 80% of the funds. And so they decelerate over a five-year period with the expectation that a local program will make up the difference. So it's giving them time to understand what the, what the staff and fiscal responsibilities are going to require to make this work. And we feel like we're hoping that in five years' time, with supporting them a lot fiscally at the beginning and then moving to a lesser amount later on that they will assume more and more responsibilities. So that in year six, 
when the state of Minnesota is not actively living in their programs, that they will have taken that on in their own. It'll be a culture in their system, and they will have the capacity to do that. So I think these fiscal agreements, it's, it's something that is fairly new, but mm -hmm. that we're feeling really positive about. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you describe it, so we've estimated the cost of installing a particular innovation in a district, and based on the size of the district, we've estimated right. an amount of money. And in year one, they get 100% of that amount with a decreasing support until they are supporting 100% of the annual cost. Um, what are the kinds of things that they're using those funds to support within the district? Uh, we said things like coaching, as example, one of those times that it's really hard to find time to coach internally. So what we've said is you could use this money if you had a classroom to hire a substitute teacher, and then that teacher would be released from their classroom duties to provide coaching responsibilities to other partners in the program. We've used the money, or we've said the money is okay for, like, we're providing very centralized training on the uh, components of each of the innovations and if you were being if the training was being offered in a town you didn't live in that you could use this money to send those staff members to that training that we will pay for some expenses around that training and that getting the staff to the right place um, we, it's to get the people initially trained, but also the long-term ongoing use of the innovation. So it might mean buying a few materials or buying some some technology that they don't necessarily have if they were talking about taping a home visit or something like that. So we've tried to be broad and let programs kind of help us because it is relatively new. We don't really know every use of it, and I think... We were pretty close to what people have been asking for so far, but we may make some changes. But we really listened, I think, in the early years of Taxi to what our, prog our implementing programs identified as barriers to sustainability mm -hmm. and came up with this as a way to help them overcome some of those mm -hmm. barriers that we've identified. As we move this system forward, what do you see as our, the next challenges we need to take on and the kind of the next areas in which we will focus developing our system. Well, I think right now um, we worked really hard over the last year to really make the training content material of each innovation um, consistent and to really have it be solidly available and we deliver the same message many places throughout the state. What we were just talking about recently is the capacity of that training. So as we age and as the population changes, we're going to have to look constantly and finding new people to provide that training for us and to create that capacity to have that person be available. That's one of the things. I think the second thing is data. I mean, we've been all about data lately and thinking about are we asking the right questions? Are the questions we asking and being answered by the tools we're using? Are we can we link the things we're doing to different parts of our work in the state and at a local level? How do we help local people? teachers, programs, individuals use their data and really understand it and create that culture of data use, that's huge in my life right now. So we're thinking about all those I things. knew you'd work that phrase in there, that culture of data use. <laughs> so we're really we're t-shirts made. Yeah, we should. <laughs> but we're really talking about that a lot because I think that that's so pivotal in this whole process to have them take over the, the ownership of this. They have to see that there's value there for them. And I think that's the way we're going to do it. Well, so as we wrap up, I just want to emphasize one thing that Michelle alluded to, and that's the resources on the Active Implementation Hub or AI Hub. I feel like Minnesota is in a wonderful place in terms of the professional development system that I think we maybe it's not in its infancy anymore. Maybe we're now in a toddlerhood, but it's going to continue to grow and change. And without the support that we've received from experts like Lisa Fox, Carol Trivett, Barb Smith, and the tremendous support of Kathy, um, Karen Blase and Melissa Van Dyke and others that Active Implementation Hub has been our go-to resource. And so um, as you out there select your evidence-based practices to incorporate within your SIP, an evidence-based practice is a critically important aspect of the work, but evidence-based or evidence-informed practices in the absence of great implementation won't get you there. Won't get you there. So find that practice and find that um, AI hub, and good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye.